Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin. In this video, I'm going to read a report I received, then read the questions and answers, and then finally, I'll give my take on the matter. Bob, this is what happened to me in 1995. I was 38 years old at the time. My parents owned a small farm in northern Virginia, in a town called Bristow, only about 45 minutes from Washington, D.C. They lived in a large house that was fairly isolated on over 50 acres of land. There were woods all around the property. The only way to the house is a quarter-mile driveway through thick trees with a field on one side. I grew up on the property and spent most of my childhood playing and exploring there. I knew all about the local animal life, which consisted of fox, rabbits, squirrels, deer, turkeys, possums, groundhogs, stuff like that, but nothing larger than a deer. However, from that property, it's hard to believe that D.C. is a short drive away. At the time of my sighting, my parents were retired, so they watched my two children while my wife and I worked. This saved a fortune on daycare. It was summer, and I was picking up the children after work. It was only 6.30 in the evening, so the scene was bright and clear. Once I bundled the children into their car seats, they were four and two years old, I began driving down the quarter-mile driveway to go home. As I began driving, I noticed something moving through the trees beside the field. I didn't think anything of it at first, as there were always deer bounding around. But then I did a double-take, because the movement didn't look like that of a deer. I saw it was some kind of large animal, racing across the field, right toward the car. I braked, because I wanted to see what it was. I wasn't expecting it to come directly in front of the car, but that's exactly what it did. It was fast. It ran on all fours like a dog, but the body shape, color, and build of the animal was unlike anything I have ever seen. The driveway was about 12 feet wide, and the creature was definitely longer from snout to tail tip than the driveway was wide. From snout to tail, it was at least 15 feet long. It had bright, orange fur, and was very slender in build. The head was not in proportion to the size of the body. The head seemed too pointy. The fur was shaggy. It was the color of a fox, with a fox-like tail that pointed up like that of a cat. It took no notice of me, but seemed to have a guilty walk, like when you light up a coyote or a raccoon that knows it's not supposed to be there. Why this animal chose to run toward my car is a mystery. To my way of thinking, any animal would run in almost any other direction, rather than towards a large, moving object like a car. I was not stunned, or upset, or in a state of wonder. I kept trying to figure out what rare animal or dog breed it was, but I kept coming up blank. But what happened next was really the shocker. Only a few seconds after the first animal passed, I saw a short, heavily muscled ape-like creature coming out of the woods. It followed the exact path of the dog-like creature. At first, I was so focused on where the fox-like animal had gone that I didn't notice the ape. It would have been visible for quite some time had I looked at it. The ape was also covered in bright orange fur, the exact same shade and thickness of bright orange color as the first animal. The second creature partially used its arms as it walked, so I'm not sure if you could accurately call it a quadruped or a biped. I don't recall if it used its knuckles or palms. This ape-like animal also crossed right in front of the car, but instead of following the fox after the road, it bear-hugged a large tree and proceeded to quickly climb into the foliage above and disappear out of sight. It moved slowly but methodically, like the way islanders climb palm trees. It only took four or five shimmies for it to get high enough to be concealed by leaves and out of sight. I watched the ape creature for as long as it took to cross the road and then shimmy the tree, maybe 45 seconds. I got out of the car and took a few steps toward the tree. I did not see the animal drop to the ground, and I would have been able to for some distance. Nor did I see it in the higher branches. It was either hiding in the tree it climbed, or it had climbed to another tree from the first tree, which seemed plausible, considering how the creature was built. The canopy was too leafy for me to have seen it make a jump. Then I thought it was probably best to get a move on. I probably would have been more proactive if my kids hadn't been with me. It was kind of weird to feel danger there, considering that's where I grew up. 
My parents' house was in shouting distance, though it wasn't visible through the trees. I got back in the car and idled for another minute or so. Then the kids got fussy. So I drove home. By the way, the kids hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary. As far as they were concerned, I just stopped the car for no particular reason. I told my mom and dad what I saw the next day. When I told them, my mom thought I must be mistaken, and my dad thought I was confused. I told my wife, too. I could tell she wanted to believe me, but I could also tell she didn't. A few months later, I thought I saw something long, slinking through the trees, but it obviously could have been a deer. If my parents lived there for some fifty years, without ever seeing anything, then the odds seem low that I would see something like this twice, and them never. To be clear, I'm not really a believer in the supernatural or of cryptids. I enjoy the accounts of unexplained happenings I watch on YouTube, but I'm also under the belief that when something physical presents itself and the mind has no history of reference, it fills in the blanks to the best of its ability. In many of the cases you've related, witnesses usually only have a fleeting glance of whatever the animal is, and they can only relate what they think they saw, not realizing that their minds have filled in the blanks with potential falsities. But I suppose I wouldn't say that about my own sighting, and I found it irritating when everyone else in my family said that I was mistaken. So I don't know. This experience doesn't really keep me up at night or anything like that. But damn, was it odd. I hope someday to know what I saw, but I don't think that day is going to come. I still don't really think I saw cryptids, or anything paranormal, I just don't know what it was. But on the other hand, I know in my heart that I didn't see anything that is definitively described. That's my story. I hope you and everyone else are well. Follow-up questions. Number one. Are there any local legends, stories, or rumors about the area? There are no local legends I can think of. Sorry to say. This would be a better story if that could be part of it. But no. The only historical fact that I can add is that my brother and I dug up many arrowheads on our property when we were kids. Various Native American tribes lived in the area. In college, I wrote a report on the land including the names of the tribes, but I can no longer remember their names. There is a lot of history there. I still have the report somewhere, but there's no mention of any connective legends. Also, I should add, the property has now been developed, and multiple houses have been erected where the house and farm once stood. Amazingly enough, though, the cedar tree that the ape-like creature crawled up is still there. I do wonder what became of the creatures. Question number two. Growing up there, was there any reason to suspect anything unusual about the area? Was there any anomalous, strange, or unsettling activity on the property? If you mean was there activity such as overturned garbage containers, or are dogs acting funny, then no, there were no such events like that. Which is too bad. That would have been helpful for your story enhancement. Number three. Did I have any bizarre sensory perception during the sighting? Examples of bizarre sensory perception being the frequently reported too quiet sensation, light refractions appearing indistinct or fuzzy, or an irrational feeling of fear or unwellness. The animals were noiseless at the point in time when I saw them. Of course, during the sighting, I was in an enclosed vehicle with the engine on. So no, I don't think things were overly quiet or any of that. I felt fear, but not intensely. Frankly, I think I responded pretty much like anyone would when unexpectedly seeing large and strange animals. I wasn't frightened in the sense that I felt like I had to leave, and I obviously didn't get the impression that my parents were in any danger at the nearby house. My blood definitely ran cold as I watched the creatures, but only for a moment, and I think it was natural, as you might say. I had kids in the car, after all. And trust me, everything is a little scarier when you become a new parent. For example, I never realized how crazy I drove until I started driving with my son in the car. Question number four. Can I describe the ape in greater detail? It seemed surprisingly short and compact, and it was hard to tell the overall size, due to the fact that while it barogged the tree, its legs were drawn up, presumably to help force its body weight upward. 
and it was hard to guess its weight, seeing as it was contorted as it shimmied up the tree. It was almost to the car by the time I first noticed it, and the car obstructed the lower half of its body, but I saw it in between the car and tree. Its build was much more muscular than chimpanzees, orangutans, or monkeys. The muscles were very large and thick. I'd say that from the top of the head to the bottom of its drawn-up legs was no more than three to three and a half feet. Question number five. Can I describe the canid-like creature in greater detail? The fox-like creature's body was incredibly elongated. Unnaturally so, I'd suggest. That's what struck me most of all when I saw it directly in front of me. Its gait was like a dog, shuffling with its head down, but it was fifteen feet long. And by the way, I mean from its nose to the end of its tail, so fifteen feet including the tail, which was long, at least two or three feet. I remember the hair on the tail was bristly, almost like the end of a broom, not shaggy like on the rest of the coat. I could tell it had a very sleek build underneath its fur. As it ran, its body was about two feet off the ground. I'm presuming that if it stood still, upright at the shoulder would probably be two and a half feet tall. As far as how much it weighed, its shape was so peculiar that I can't be certain, but I would say 90 or 100 pounds would be the bare minimum. Question number six. In my report, I said, quote, To be clear, I am not a believer of the supernatural or of cryptids. How can I say that and maintain that my sighting occurred? What did I see if not cryptids? Well, when you put it that way, I guess I lied. I believed in such things when I was a teenager, and even still as a young man. But the older I grew, the more I began to believe that this stuff is all for fun. It's the age-old internal conflict between believing because there's reason to believe and believing because of the desire to believe. Part of me is certain that the two creatures I saw have a simple, if not uncommon, explanation, and yet I have no idea what that explanation could be. They both moved so incredibly naturally, yet significantly off from any of the animals they may resemble. Biologically, both animals seem to make sense, almost as if they were just missed in the field guide somehow. So I guess you're right. Technically they were cryptids, and I know I saw them, so I must believe in cryptids. Maybe part of me is still holding out for the aha moment when I realize precisely what they are, but that moment hasn't come yet, and it's not looking like it will any time soon. Question number seven. I said that I told my parents the next day, wasn't I concerned that two large and strange animals were nearby, one of which likely being a predator? Interesting. I never really thought of that. Like I said, I got out of the car I wasn't particularly threatened by the animals. Plus, as strange as this sounds, the animals seemed mission-oriented. They were going somewhere, and their direction was away. End of questions and answers. Okay, hi. Back to me. My first thought had to do with the property being located within a short drive to D.C., even though the city of the District of Columbia is dangerous and impoverished, obviously. Many wealthy and connected people live outside the city limits, and it doesn't seem terribly unlikely that some humble public servant would acquire unique animals. But, of course the problem is, is that these animals don't seem to exist, and therefore acquisition would be impossible, one would imagine. This is the first report I've ever received that includes two distinct types of cryptids at the same time. And I suppose first, I'll talk about the fox-like creature. As far as I can tell, it has no potential rooting in strict biology. At 15 feet in length, even from slender snout to long tail, it's just far too long for any animal that only stands two and a half feet or even three feet tall, except for maybe a crocodile. The largest feline carnivore ever recorded was a nine-year-old male Siberian tiger that's according to Guinness records. The specimen was 3.32 meters from nose to the tip of the tail, so that's 10 feet and 11 inches in length. He weighed 932 pounds, and like most tigers, he was somewhere between 3 and 4 feet at the shoulder. I think this image is fairly representative of the scale I'm talking about. We can assume the road in the picture is 15 feet wide, so the tiger, at 10 feet in length, takes up about two-thirds of it. So again, 
If the witness saw a creature lower to the ground than this, and a third longer, then he saw something truly remarkable. So the canid creature described was significantly longer and shorter than a tiger, which makes me think of something weasel-like. Something lower to the ground with an elongated body. But of course, that trait dissipates as size increases, as far as terrestrial weasel-type things are concerned. Aquatic weasel-type things maintain that slender build. The general shape and form of the creature described vaguely reminded me of a thylacine, sometimes called the Tasmanian tiger or Tasmanian wolf, though it's neither of those things. The thylacine is a regrettably extinct carnivorous marsupial previously known to inhabit mainland Australia, Tasmania, and New Guinea. The last wild thylacine known to have been sighted in the wild was shot to death in 1930, leaving the only two known thylacines to live in zoos. The specimen in London only survived until 1931. She died half a world away from the only other of her kind, a thylacine known only as Benjamin. He died in an Australian zoo in 1936. His must have been a unique loneliness. Anyway, a thylacine is the height of the creature reported, though a thylacine's nose to tail tip should be about 180 centimeters, or 5 feet and 9 inches in length. So the cryptid would have been the height, and presumably girth, of a thylacine, but over twice its length, which would be a fascinating thing to see, and explains why the witness was so iffy on the weight, because that's just not proportioned like anything we're used to seeing. As for the ape, well, if it was an orangutan or a chimpanzee, I'm sure he just would have said that. To me, the strangest aspect of this account is the fact that the creatures were both uniformly covered in the same shade of thick and shaggy orange hair. Not just the same color, but the same coat. I wouldn't say orangish red is rare, but it's definitely not common. I don't know, that's a detail that kind of triggers my spook factor. Because forget the if this happened, and the what happened, the uniform orange makes me think why. Were the animals from somewhere? And I use the term somewhere loosely, but somewhere where that trait is common? Or were they designer animals? Designed to be that way. And then I guess the question becomes, who's the designer, and why? Two separate species of animals, having an identical coat, far supersedes the weirdness of either beast alone. But maybe that's just me. It's simple to dismiss reports like this. Either the witness is lying, confused, or mistaken. Well, I have no idea why he would lie. It's not a particularly intriguing story. He didn't want any compensation or recognition. As for being mistaken, he doesn't seem mistaken. And as for confused, I think we would all be a little confused, for one reason or another. Anyway, make sure you like the video and subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, thanks an awful lot for listening.